With the start of spring training upon us, it is time to take a good look at what the Dodgers have going on around the roster as we head into the new season, as we head into spring training. Uh, in this finale episode, in part four of this four-part series, we dive into the infield, catcher through shortstop, and break down all the positives, uh, every potential concern for the Dodgers heading into the season. There's absolutely a lot to unpack here on another edition of the All Dodgers Podcast. First, my name is Clint Pasillas. Find me as Real FRG on the social media machines, the Twitter, the X, whatever they call it, uh, the Instagram. Uh, and find me here on the All Dodgers YouTube channel. Please consider subscribing to the channel. If you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe. If you're not new to the channel but you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe. It's totally free. And uh, give the video a thumbs up if you enjoy it. Uh, and find us at alldodgers.com. But without further ado, let's get into the last part of the series. All right, so we end our spring training preview series with my cleanup hitter, a legend, my dog, the 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 goat. I'm going to call you the goat, man. My friend, Mr. Doug McCain, DMAC underscore LA, if you're nasty. What's going on, Douglas? Mr. Clint Busseas, there's nothing I love more than talking Dodger baseball to you. How you doing, man? <laughs> I, I'm doing well. I'm wrapping up a, a series where, where hype spring training is here. Pitchers and catchers have reported. And like I said in the intro, today we're talking Dodgers infield outlook heading into spring training. And I think we know of any area on this Dodgers roster, this is by far the most solidified. This is the most set in stone part of this team. But it's also got its little question marks. People like you and me, we enjoy digging and prodding and breaking the worst, the potential worst case scenarios down. So uh, we'll we'll get through catcher through shortstop, and I'll get you out of here, man. You know the the questions we wonder. Is can Will Smith rise to the occasion as a potential cleanup hitter for this roster laden with stars? Is everyday Freddie maybe should he not be an everyday, everyday kind of guy anymore? Will Mookie actually play second base all through the season? Can Max Muncy put together a complete year uh, as, a, as a hitter and a defender? And is Lux going to put all that knee stuff behind him? So we're going to get through all that. Let's open on Will Smith and the catcher position. Willie, your brother, your doppelganger, had a nice year in 2023, but it was overall kind of a step backwards from his 21, from his 22, uh, even his debut season, obviously off the charts in 20. What do you think we see from Will in 2024? Yeah, I think in 2023, you look at the year he had, dealt with the rib issue, dealt with the concussion issue. His numbers across the board weren't up to the standard that we saw in 2022. Still made his first all-star team, still was above average, still gave you 19 home runs. But I think that one aspect that no one really mentions about Will Smith was all the injuries and dealing with the pitchers, right? Mm -hmm. And you had him in a, in a situation where he's having to develop these young pitchers and having to go through that process while getting banged up, making his first all-star team. And I think that you're kind of seeing a little bit of a regression, but I don't think that it's something that is – withstanding. I think it's something that is it is not long term. I think that Will Smith is going to go back to 2022 version of Will Smith and I think when you mentioned the cleanup spot that's really interesting to me because of course you know the top three already in the lineup. You're going to have Mookie, Freddie, Otani. Of course Dave's going to have a conversation about it but Will Smith at cleanup versus Teoscar Hernandez as a possibility is it kind of what I'm wondering. In my dream line, I actually have Teoscar Hernandez batting cleanup Same. and kind of moving Will Smith down in the order but still Look, he's Will Smith, man. He hits the ball hard. He's someone that is a clutch hitter. I mean, the numbers last year, I mean, who wouldn't take a hitter that's 21% above league average offensively? Yeah, I mean, he, Will Will Will's going to go out there and do what he does best, and and he's going to have a lot less pressure on him this year. Like you mentioned, the the, the concussion, the rib, he's just got to do his part to stay healthy. Of course, a, a lot of folks don't. Uh, you know, you see the chat. There's not a lot of love you get out there for Austin Barnes. He's got to be a little bit better to pick up Will and not need him to be in that lineup, you know, six days a week or whatever it is. But that's one of the reasons why, like, I agree with you. I put out a tweet early on uh, after, like, right after the, the Hernandez signed it. I like to ask her in that number four spot because you keep that continuity one through five on the days where Will's sitting. That's just me. I don't know how much you change beyond that in your lineup, but – we know Dave loves Will batting cleanup, though. 
Yeah, for sure. And he didn't get any chance to do it last year, right? He was mainly batting outside of that. And you saw in 2022, he got more opportunities to do that and wasn't really his best spot in the lineup. But I think that this version of Will Smith, a healthy version, there's no doubt about it. in this lineup with that kind of protection with the how stacked it is, he's going to have results wherever he hits. But I think one aspect of his game that people haven't mentioned is just how he's improved as a game caller, how yeah. he's improved as someone that understands each pitcher's what they're great at and just how to really build that rapport and that chemistry. I mean, you talk to players in the clubhouse and really that's one thing they say about Will Smith is his improvement as a game caller. And also too, you remember last year at the beginning of the season, when he went on that injured list, I mean, they started to struggle. I mean, they They were eight and seven without him. They were 19 and five with him. So he's one of those guys where when he's in the lineup, the team just plays better as a whole for a lot of different reasons. But let's be honest. He's not someone that you're going to pay over $100 million or possibly $85 million in a couple of years because of what he can do behind the dish. It's what he can do at the plate. So you want to see him get back to the Will Smith that we saw a couple of years ago, but I definitely think injuries were a factor. Also, I think mechanics, he talked about how those he was kind of overcorrecting because of the yeah. injury. So, look, the biggest key to him is health, and the reality is when he's out there in the lineup, he's healthy, he's going to produce, and I expect nothing less from him this season. It's kind of interesting, too. I mean, an all-star catcher, most – Teams out there, he's on their billboards, right? He's their big bobblehead night, right? Yeah. He's the JT Real Muto of certain teams. He gets lost in the shuffle, right? Yeah. He's a little overshadowed, and rightfully so, considering the talent. But I think that's almost going to help him this season. Same. Just stay locked in, stay focused, and not have to deal with any pressure. The the biggest expectations on him is, yeah, you can't worry about that pitching staff before anything else and just – you know, do your part as one of the the. I mean, he obviously is an important part of the lineup because he's one of the few right-handed batters. But I like I like Will heading into the season, and I think uh, like you're saying the the lack of um or I, I won't call it the lack the absence of that insane pressure on him is going to play up. And if he does end up betting fifth or sixth, that's going to help him out a whole lot as well. Let's uh, let's move down uh, on your your scorecard here, Freddie Freeman. We know he's been the man since joining the Dodgers two years ago. He's been better, honestly, than he's ever been in his career. But he's coming off a season that saw him pressing to reach some milestone numbers at the end of the year and a postseason that saw him collect just one hit in 10 at-bats. He's also not getting any younger. He turns 35 this September. Is this the season where maybe, just maybe, Dave Roberts and the Dodgers need to sit Freddie down and tell him, hey, having some days off is okay. Don't worry about this. We need you in October. It makes you wonder because he's someone that is adamant. He's adamant saying, look, I get paid to play every single day. Okay, Mm -hmm. I signed these big contracts for a reason. He loves to play. He loves to post. I've said in the past that you would need to have the Dodger Stadium security team get him off of first base. You'd have to surround first base with barbed wire to not have him play. And then there's the rest versus rust factor. And he still played all throughout the season, but did struggle in the postseason. And I think a lot of it had to do with the five day layoff. I hate making excuses. I think it's more of an explanation, but still, I think that as you mentioned, he's not getting any younger, but he's still able to avoid the aging curve, right? He's avoiding the decline last season. I mean, we're talking about a guy, 59 doubles, set the Dodgers franchise record, 29 home runs. Offensively, he's been incredible. But I think defensively, you think I think as a whole, it's going to take its toll on this team. And you kind of hope that this team has the division sewn up towards the end and they're resting guys and they're saying, okay, Freddie, look, we need you for October, okay? And he actually had a pretty decent postseason against the Padres a few seasons ago, having posted that long. So, look, he loves to play. He loves to be out there. It's going to be tough to get him off and have a rest day. And hopefully they clinch early because we saw last season when they clinched and then he was able to sit. So maybe yeah. you could convince him then. So I'm hoping for a big lead in the NL West towards the end to get him some much needed rest. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, his his thing was like, look, my swing was just out of whack at the wrong time. The same thing kind of happened with Mookie. Mookie, who we're going to talk about right now, he kind of ran himself more into the ground quite literally in August with how many runs scored. And I'm pretty sure that was one of the things uh, I think I think we had Jose Mota in the office at that one point, and Jose was talking about that, like, look at how many runs this dude scored in August. Like, he was burnt out by the time September rolled around. But, hey, let's talk Mookie. Ten seasons, six gold gloves, an MVP Mookie Betts moving out of right field and is set to become the full-time second baseman. What do you like about it? Is this the move? I still think it's absolutely the move. I remember back last summer 
and being in that clubhouse and Mookie just straight up saying that I don't consider myself a right fielder. I don't consider yeah. myself an outfitter. I'm a middle infielder. And if it weren't for Pedroia, that's where he still would have played. Now, to no fault of his own, he turned to, like you mentioned, a six-time Gold Glove Award winner, one of the best right fielders in the game. But having said that, if you look at some of the peripherals, if you look at some of the stat cast metrics, he is a below average runner. He actually hasn't played elite, elite right field in the last couple of seasons. It's been really good. There's no doubt about yeah. it. But this is someone that he was happy playing in the infield. He wants to play second base. And look, the bottom line is this that you can find right fielders, you can find outfielders that can produce offensively. You can't do that with second baseman. I mean, yeah. it's very difficult to find second baseman that can produce like that. Last season, he was incredible, 163 OPS+. plus. That would have been the 48th best season in major league history for a right fielder. That would have been the fifth best for a wow. second baseman. So it's about the premium at what he does at the plate with a, the bat and knowing that, look, I think that you can get more games and more, like Dave said, you get more games, more bats out of him at second base at the Keystone. And look, defensively, he was minus one outs above average, which is basically league average. But my boy, Mickey Vargas, was minus seven. So defensively, he was an upgrade. <laughs> Offensively, you're not going to find anyone close to being as productive as he can be at that position. And like Mookie said, Jason Hayward came to us and said, I got right field, so he feels good about it. I think that's where they're at. How do you yeah. feel? But I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, on, on defense, I like the idea that, look, going into last year, he still had right field on the mind. He didn't really – I mean, he played a little bit of infield, obviously getting ready for the World Baseball Classic, but he didn't even play the it, really any second base during the WBC for uh, Mark D. Rose, uh Team USA. He kind of just – Forced his way into the infield out of you know injuries, you you lose Lux, and then Rojas gets hurt in, in April, and he had, he goes and makes his debut. We love him seeing him at shortstop. Really started to settle in at second base, but now he's got an entire off season to work on it. Um, really get the the footwork going, uh, get all the angles back, shake off the rust. He had a nice you know reintroduction to it at the big league level uh, last year. So I really like the idea of it. What I like is that it it looks like it's gonna fire him up. It looks like it's gonna motivate. Him. I don't know. Uh, I didn't catch all of the interviews you guys did down um, on the the uh, in the bullpen, but I did catch him on Sports in LA. And one of the things, uh, he, you know, he kind of lit up when Hartung asked him about playing second baseman or second base or whoever asked him about it. And he was just like, you know what? He's 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 motivated to get go out and get another Gold Glove, but at a different position. And that that fires me up to see Mookie fired up because otherwise. You know, you watch Mookie and you're wondering, like, is, is he worried about his next bowling game or is he worried about, uh, you know, getting home and hanging with the boys and making another YouTube video? Maybe he'll be focused that much more. And we've already seen still very, very good Mookie when he's he's playing something he's not necessarily over enjoying. So how much better can he be uh, playing the spot where he wants to be? Yeah, no, to your point, I mean, you're talking about a guy that they, he was playing there at a necessity yeah. at the beginning, right? And the fact that you even played that at an average level shows you how talented you are. It shows that you showed up and you were taking those ground balls for years just in case you were thrusted into that position. Now, I will say, I have a little trepidation knowing that the Keystone combination is a Mookie Betts who <laughs> is becoming yeah. that everyday second baseman for the first time going with a Gavin Lux, right? If it was a Betts and a Miguel Rojas, I would feel a little more comfortable about it. But at the end of the day, it's offensively what he can do with the stick. I mean, you look at his projections. He's far and away projected to be the best offensive second baseman. If you're a right fielder, he'd be fourth, right? So look at the average OPS versus a right fielder and a second baseman. I mean, it's just not normal to see those kind of numbers. I mean, a guy had 39 home runs yeah. at second base. So you just don't see that every day. But I think you bring up the best point. The most important thing is, look, this is someone who, look, let's just be honest. You got those friends there. You can do the Rubik's Cube. They don't have to try that hard. They're talented, right? You yeah. shredding on your guitar right there, right? Playing stairway to have a guitar center, right? I mean, look, sometimes things come easy. And for those types of guys, it's always good to throw a new challenge at. And like you said, I got those same vibes too. He is giddy 
yeah. when he talks about playing second base, which is crazy because my man has a hose in freaking right field. He can throw guys out and do it at an elite level. So it just really speaks to the talent level of Mookie Betts. You really don't see this that often, a guy this late in his career going from right field to second base. But he's one of the unique athletes in the history of the sport that can absolutely do it at a high level. One more real quick one on Mookie. And, and then you mentioned Lux. I do want to talk about the kind of question marks of the infield. But if – Hayward struggles if if you know uh, the clock strikes midnight on Hayward it doesn't work out this year do you think they'd consider moving Mookie back out there kind of pulling the ripcord and moving him back out to right I do I think everything's on the table with this organization that's one thing I've always learned is everything's fluid there are no hard rules and Dave said it as needed so it's as needed and look maybe Jason Hayward does not produce like he did last season because let's be honest before last year, he had struggled for years, yeah. not a year, four years, right? Is he going to be able to continue to hit the ball hard and have success? I think in his role where he's going up against righties and I think he's going to hit the ball hard and farewell, I definitely could see that. Manuel Margot, are they going to keep him? Are they going to trade him, right? Is he someone that's going to produce there? Teoscar Hernandez, I feel really good about. James Altman, is he an everyday player or is he a platoon guy, right? Chris Taylor, how does he produce this season? So I think last season, I mean, offensively, in the outfield, that's one area where they significantly act. I mean, that lacked. I mean, they were in the yeah. 20s when it came to the left field production. Center field, James Allen was <laughs> above average, and Jason Hayward, he did a fine job out there in right field. And you saw David Peralta, he mixed in there, didn't have power late in the season. But I do think that there is a world where you, if you need to move Mookie to the outfield to add an infielder that boosts the offense and boosts the defense, that they absolutely would consider it. Yeah, I mean, if there's something where, again, uh, Jay Hay isn't playing right, isn't playing well, Outman isn't playing well, you know, you still are paying Chris Taylor a lot of money, and he's played a lot of uh, you know quality second base in his career. Miguel Rojas, one of the best defenders in the game, if you need to do that or you need to put him at short and 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 move Lux, and that's why I like you know you, you talk about it. they got the flexibility, they're open to just about anything, and I think. That's um, that's what this team is is uh, going to be more about than we've ever seen, and they've always kind of been like, yeah, I'll do whatever the team needs. That's what that's what you say as a baseball player. I think this is going to be a team where 100 percent they'll do whatever the team needs that particular day. But moving on, I know you got to get the hell out of here soon enough. No, um, we go along, you want, man? Okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, they'll figure it out. Uh, just 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 get a, get an Uber, you know. But yeah. Uh, all right, so there are if if there's anywhere there are kind of two question marks ish guys that we'll say are sort of highlighted in the Dodgers greater list of potential concerns entering the season. That's Max Muncy, Gavin Lux. Let's talk Muncy first. Not a good season in 23, but far from a bad season. A lot of pop as usual, but you know, he had the, the tough batted ball luck uh, defense tough. We know that was tough. He addressed it at fan fest. I appreciate him. Talk about that. Uh, you know, we talk, I talked about the defense a shit ton last year on blue heaven with you, of course. Uh, you know, it was, it was sus, but what are your expectations for max? You now we've, we've heard him a bunch on foul territory. He was on again, uh, today when we're recording this and then you talked to him, of course, at, at fan fest, what are your expectations for max in 24? I think fair expectations are get as close to being an average defender as possible because his best defense is his offense. And you'll live with <laughs> just slightly below average defense if you have a 118 weighted runs created plus. If you're hitting 36 home runs and 105 RBI and you have the on-base percentage that he's able to post. If he can produce like that, you'll live with it. But I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that it does concern me. When I wake up 3 3 in the morning in a cold sweat, I definitely think of a – Double down the line in the NLDS, Hassan Kim and him unable to get to that. I asked Max Muncy at Dodger Fest about his defense and what he was doing the offseason to try to correct and just be in a better position to have success at the hot corner. He basically said that early in the year he had a couple of mishaps yeah, he got that up. really got to him. Yeah. And I appreciate that because most guys, you know, they'll talk about injury and being it's a physical issue, but he talked about how that snowballed. So if it's truly confidence, if it's confidence that's the issue – then I feel like, okay, I think he can improve. But, you know, everyone facts the fight. The numbers will tell you, I mean, the zone, you know, total zone rating minus five. I mean, if you look at, he was, I mean, the fourth worst. Basically, he was the fourth worst defender if you aggregate all the defensive metrics, defensive run, save, total zone rating. And it just does not speak to someone who's playing the third base position defensively at an average level. Remember Justin Turner? He was in the gold glove talk, right? Yeah. For a couple of years. And then what happened? Lost a few steps. 
and he was below average. So he also said that he's looking for more flexibility and a little more mobility. So I think that if that is an area where he's improved upon, hopefully he can get there. But like I said, if it's a situation where he's struggling defensively, gets off to a slow start offensively, he did struggle against lefties last season. He's somebody you want to keep your eyes on early in the year, for sure. Is uh, it, We'll just say it. Is the D going to be um, – do you think it's going to be less of an issue, or is it could could we see a world – where maybe down the road, let's focus on this this part of it. Could we see a world where down the road, Miguel Rojas finds a role as a defenseman, defensive placement at third, uh, replacement at third late in games? Do you think that could happen? Absolutely, 100%. I think that's why they traded for Miguel Rojas originally. That's why you gave up Jacob Amaya, because he was going to be that breaking case of emergency band-aid at every infield position. Look, I would like Freddie Freeman to give him a high five and him go to the bench <laughs> and let him play some first base, right? I think Miguel <laughs> Rojas is someone that – He's so talented defensively. You could see a late-game substitution. The same token, look, Max Muncy, people just do not give him enough credit for what he's able to do at the plate. I mean, we're not talking about a good Dodger, a great Dodger. He's a couple of good seasons away from being an iconic Dodger. No, right? He's already I top agree. 10 in home runs, 175 bombs. He could be up to eight this season, right? I mean, he's someone that's climbing that list. And offensively, Look, you're not going to have every play. That's why it's so rare. I mean, look at Miguel Rojas. People talking about his defense. On the flip side, he can't hit as well, right? So it's like you just can't have it all. Not everyone can go out there and be a Mookie Betts. Not everyone can go out, go out there and be a Freddie Freeman. That's what separates those players. That's why good players are good players. Average players are average players. And all-stars are all-stars, right? Yeah. But I do think that that is something they're going to want to consider and monitor early on is how much is his defense impacting games? I mean – even you saw in the postseason, you, you saw Max Muncy just during certain spots where, look, if it's a big situation, there is a quickness issue. There's a yeah. their inability to get to a, a certain ball issue. And I think with a restricted shift, you have to make those reads. You have to be a little more athletic out there. And then you add the fact that he's going with a Gavin Lux, who this will be his first year as an everyday shortstop. It's absolutely, honestly, quite frankly, it's my, pretty much my biggest concern about this team right now. Yeah, on on uh, on Muncy, you know, you do worry about that first step quickness. You worry about the arm. It's a strong arm, but it's a slow arm. He's got a little bit of a wind up to him for sure, almost like an outfielder's arm. But you know, you mentioned uh, the the power, how important the power is. Uh, you know, I used to work with a guy who said, if you want the dub, you got to slug, but you also got to mitigate those those doubles down the line and run prevention. <laughs> run prevention. That that's it's a uh, it's going to be an interesting. Um, um, uh, I guess storyline to watch throughout the season for sure. Uh, you mentioned Lux. We mentioned Lux a few times. You know Lux. Finally, Gavin Lux, my guy, my BFF. I love Gavin, but it's tough love. You know this. And I made a decision here this offseason on on my all Dodger show here to be all in on Luxy at shortstop this season. Uh, yes. I have back of mind concerns still about that knee, about the mentals that come along with that injury, but I'm going to try to stay positive and say it's going to be a non-issue. I think he gets a few games in during the Cactus League and he starts to feel real Gucci. Where are you at overall? And and I get the sense that you, you mentioned waking up at 3.30 in a cold sweat. I get the sense you're not... You're not, I don't, I don't know about enthralled, but you got some of those back of mind concerns on Luxie as well. I mean, look, you look at this defense as a whole, right? Where are the premium defenders? Where are the above average defenders? Even Freddie Freeman isn't yeah. as good of a defensive first baseman as he was from a few years ago. Mookie, we just mentioned, he's average at second base, which is impressive considering it's a position change. Gavin Lux, Max Muncy, Will Smith. I mean, where are the premium defenders in the infield? Really don't see those guys. But the good thing is they'll probably score 900-plus runs, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's definitely the positive. But as far as Gavin Lux goes, I think if you get 275 out of him, and close to average defense, you're feeling good about that. Batting right there in the eighth or ninth spot, being like a second leadoff hitter, the success he had a few seasons ago, he was batting in that eighth or ninth spot, had a 129 weighted runs created plus a 797 OPS. So you really want him to feel good about himself offensively, and I think you do that by making sure he has no glaring issues defensively. And I was talking to Chris Taylor a few weeks ago, and I asked him, hey, what is the big difference about playing the shortstop position with the restricted shift? And he told me that you have to rely on your jump and your range and your athleticism. Your reads off the bat have to be quicker. And it's not like it was before that, where you could load up the left side. You didn't have to worry about it as much. You didn't have guys overlapping. So you didn't have to cover as much ground. So let's think about this, Clint. You've got a guy who's a first-time shortstop at one of the most difficult positions to play in sports. 
And on top of that, he's coming off an injury, a significant knee injury. On top of that, he's playing for the first time with the restricted shift. Oh, and on top of that, back when he filled in for Corey Seager in 2021, he did not post great numbers defensively. I mean, he was below average defensively at that shortstop position. So I'm not saying he can't do it because he is athletic. He is a natural shortstop. He did come up playing that position, but I need to see it. I believe he can do it, but I need to see it to prove it. So for me to sit here and say, okay, uh, he's, I'm guaranteeing he's going to be a great shortstop. It's just me bloviating and trying to act, you know, <laughs> trying to get an interview with him in the clubhouse, right? So <laughs> let's be honest with you. So I'm still in wait and see mode with Lux. I believe he can do it, but I need to see. It almost feels like it's a, he's a backup quarterback in the NFL that sat behind a starter for like three seasons, yeah. and finally he's going to get his opportunity to live out every baseball player's dream and be the starting shortstop for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, you got to say it with a little tear in your eye too, man. But uh, lot, a lot stacked against my guy, Luxy. But um, you know what? I think he's he's been through so much shit. Like this, this should be the easy part. Like let's get to the good part. This is the good part. He understands what's at stake and what's good for him. What's even easier for him? Like the expectations are so low, man. Like you said, just go out there and play a good enough defense at short. Don't be a liability and and keep the line moving. I you know, I'm calling him the best number nine hitter in baseball. I think you you put him in that nine spot. You just leave him there because I'd rather have Outman or, or Hayward in front of him and get Mookie right behind him. But um, again, I'm going to be all in on Luxie until I have to sell my stock on him. But uh, my guy, as I appreciate. As far as I mean, honestly, I want to get your opinion on, on, okay, on okay. the Dama situation because, I mean, there's some more talk that he could be available. And here's what I'm at with Lux, okay? I mean, like I said, in 2021, 34 short stops, 400 innings played, is negative five outs above average. That was eighth worst. So yeah. I think he can do it. But like I said, anyone out there just pretending – to truly believe that he is going to be that guy at the position, let's wait and see. I definitely think he has it in him, and I think that that would be the best case scenario for the Dodgers to find the long-term solution in Gavin Lux with all these years of team control. That's exactly what you want. You want Lux yeah. to look the part. You want Outman to look the part because it makes it easier to acquire guys outside that. You know, there's 10 guys on the planet. There's 10 guys on the planet. Well, actually, nine now because of Wander Franco. He's gone, but Bruh. there's only nine guys on the planet that are above average bats and average defenders at that position. It's extremely difficult, but having Miguel Rojas, I mean, that's why the Dodgers are the Dodgers, is can you imagine that? You have Miguel Rojas, a top four defender by every single metric as your depth piece, okay? So I think that that is going to be a saving grace for this team, knowing you can turn to him if you need him. But yeah, if Gavin Lux does not work out, they have all the prospects in the world. Yep. They have all the ability in the world to go out there and upgrade at that position. I would not completely rule that out, even if it meant bringing in the shortstop like Adamas and trying to get an extension. He's still young. He's cool with Mookie. Yes, he's not the prototypical Dodgers hitter that you know no. hits for on base. I mean, he hits for power, strikes out a lot. But defensively, these guys, you know, you love defense more than anyone I've ever seen when it comes to I'm, baseball defense. I'm big on the defensive D. guy, right? Yeah. Watching the Rojas's, watching the Adamas's, these guys are like blessed from the baseball gods, right? It's almost things you can't teach. No, it really is. You, know, you mentioned, uh, you know, having that that kind of um, I'm going to call it a band aid, really, with with Rojas there. But it's not like with with Miguel Rojas. Let's say Lux doesn't work out. You don't have the first street, you know, generic Target brand band aids. We're talking about band aid brand with the band-aid. Flintstones on them. You know, like we got the premium uh, band aid there with Rojas. But I what I've been saying is I I see a lot of how things played out with um with Miguel Vargas last year. It's like they gave him a few months when it became painfully apparent like hey, it wasn't going to work out and I'm I'm sorry to you. I know you are still uh, probably all alone on the Vargas train right now. It's got to be a lonely ride, lonely. but <laughs> when they when they pulled that plug on it, you know, they had a plan. There was a backup plan and sure the Mookie thing worked out, but if it didn't, they would have found another plan somewhere. So, you have plan A is Luxie. You have plan B, which is a temporary. If that doesn't work or there's a major injury, you got uh, you know some combination of Rojas and CT3, and then you know who's going to be available. Painfully apparent who's going to be available at the trade deadline. It's going to be Willie Adamas, somebody this team has talked about, we've talked about for the last three years, two years it seems like, for this um, for this organization. So they're in a good spot, and then by then you would assume – this the Dodgers get a lot more love in the farm system rankings. The all these pitchers, you know, 
play a little bit more. They get a lot more love from from the uh, prospectors. And then all of a sudden you have, you know, a top 10 farm system moving up to a top two. And then you're like, hey, go go take one of these guys. You know, hurt to lose Nick Frosso. But even without that, even without all of the the shine of having people in the top 100, they still got a lot of, of um, uh, you know, we'll say requ- or desirable talent that that could go and and for two months of Adamus you would imagine the Dodgers can give up not too much and be able to pull him if needed but we still hope for plan a we want Lux to work out 100 percent. and even if I could get Adamus today for Lux the answer would be no right I would hang up I'll cut the cord they'd be hearing <laughs> dial tone because you need to see if you can get these you guys a, you have a cell phone under team control <laughs> to have success, homegrown town. And that's the first case. And I think that's what this first part of the season is going to be about, assessing certain yep. positions that you might want to address because they have made a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece for this Dodgers roster. But I think that if there are certain positions that are just legitimate questions, it's the left side of that infield defensively. But, hey, guess what? We never talked about Corey Seager's defense. You know why? My man could rake with the best of them. My man had a generational hit tool. So, hey, Gav Lux, hit 300 and – leave the yard more than six times, you get double-digit home runs, we will live with below-average defense. But that's going to be the big thing for him is can, will his defense, and if he has defensive struggles, will that bleed into his offense? Because it's a very cerebral position. Yep. You heard what Max Muncy talking about, the snowball effect of missing plays. Think about all the attention. Imagine if you're in Seoul, Korea, and he boots one to lose a game. Okay? I mean, yeah. th- this is just not going to be your normal Dodger season. So we'll see how he handles it because – He's someone that we know. He's been. We see, it feels like he's been in the t- on the team for like two decades. It really right? does, man. We've been it's talking about this good right? dude for so damn long. I mean, I did, I did an inter- interview with him, a phone interview, like like two, three months before he made his debut, and you know that's when he was hitting three fifty five, three ninety at Triple A, just owning the world. But then the world came and kicked him in the dick real hard, real quick, and then everything, you know kind of snowballed on him and and it's about time to reemerge from that snowball uh you know at trust that knee is going to hold together don't let your neck get out of whack like you've done the last uh, two seasons win healthy and go play ball that's all I got to do it's that simple just go play ball and uh I think Luxie's going to do it, man. I think he's going to do it. But the fact that we've talked about him for this long that tells me we we definitely got those underlying worries uh at short Hey, show me something, man. I believe in him. There are a lot of made men on this team. A lot of made men. He needs to make himself a made man, right? That's a challenge for him. And like I said, health-related last season, and it seems like it's always something. But I think that hopefully the baseball gods will bless him this year. Just give me a full, healthy Gavin Lux for a whole season. Let's see what we have. And I think that he has a chance to be the long-term solution at shortstop, but he has to prove it. And I think he's going to get a great opportunity in the runway to do so. So, like I said, we'll see. My guy, Doug McCain, I always love talking baseball with you, man. It's one of the treats. Uh, You had it right the first time. (laughs) But uh, everybody already knows where the hell to find you. But for the folks who have been living under a rock, tell them what you do and uh, where to find you. Yeah, you can follow me on X, Instagram, DMAC underscore LA, tune in Dodgers, dugout live. But you know what, though? Forget that, uh, Mr. Clint is Hey, (laughs) talking baseball with you, I cannot thank you enough, man. I would not be here. I would not have a show if it weren't for you. All ball knowers in Dodgerland know that you know ball as good or more than any of you. Forgot more baseball than anyone <laughs> than most people have ever thought of. So yeah, man, it's great. Man, I love the channel. Love your site. I think it's awesome what you're doing, man. And like I said, it's great to see you back in in Dodgerland because Dodgers fans and the Dodgers universe absolutely needs your take and your opinion on all this stuff. Because hey. Here's the thing. A lot of sunshine pumpers out there, Clint. A lot of fanboys that are sipping that Kool-Aid, right? Yes, Always sir. Always appreciate the honesty, the realism, and dare I say a little pessimism occasionally <laughs> to kind of keep us all grounded and level. I think we need that in Dodgeland, and you provide that in, in spades, my man. Appreciate you. Love you, my guy. Uh, right back at you, man. You're the man, Clint. All right, so we're back here. We got the sunlight. 
different times. I know it's the magic of the internet. But guys, thank you again to Doug for joining the channel. Always appreciate working with my dude again. I want to know what you guys think about this Dodgers infield. Uh, do you think they should maybe pair back Freddie Freeman from playing every single day this year? Will Mookie work out at second base? Of course he's going to work out. But of course, the big questions. Will we see a bounce back? Uh, all around bounce back for Max Muncy at third base? And will Gavin Lux finally Finally put all the pieces together uh, and put together at least a serviceable season in that nine hole for the Dodgers. Sound off about all your comments, all your concerns, all those things uh, for these Dodgers heading into the new season. Again, I am Clint Pasillas. Find me as Real FRG on the social media machines. Subscribe to the channel. Give this video a thumbs up if you have not. It really helps me out. That was annoying. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.